after that brilliant speech about Islamophobia, I want to talk about something quite specific uh, that I think connected. Um, what do the following have in common? The introduction of ID cards, a national identity register, a national database of all children in schools, it, intrusive powers of entry, surveillance powers being used by local authorities to spy on people, and the permanent retention of innocent people's DNA. They were all policies introduced or proposed by the 1997 to 2010 Labour government. They were also all policies which both the Liberal Democrat and the Conservative 2010 manifestos promised not to introduce or to repeal. Indeed, the civil liberties sections of the 2010 Lib Dem and Tory manifestos, page 93 and 79, should you care to check, were virtually identical in all respects but one. Labour's manifesto didn't have a civil liberties section at all. How could this have happened? Labour has a long and proud tradition of promoting social progress. It was Labour that ended hanging, decriminalised homosexuality and abortion, and liberalised the divorce laws in the 60s. And indeed in the 90s it was Labour which passed the Human Rights Act, which incorporated the rights set out in the European Convention on Human Rights into domestic British law. This meant that if a person's rights to freedom of speech and assembly, a fair trial, family life, or from torture or inhumane treatment, slavery or forced labour, were for the first time incorporated into British law. So if those rights were breached, you could take your case to a British court. In its effect, it was one of the most progressive pieces of legislation since the passing of the Bill of Rights in 1689. So what changed? What happened between that and the vast increase in surveillance, ever-expanding databases, and plans for ID cards? And for that matter, control orders, detention of people's children, and 28-day detention without charge. That's after the government failed to introduce detention for 90 days. Well, we all know the answer. It was the war on terror, which led, as the war came back home, to the demonization of British Muslims as potential or actual terrorists. The result of this was not just tabloid headlines, though there were enough of those. It included a seemingly endless parade of terrorism and counter-terrorism uh, legislation. The first of which defined terrorism, you might think pretty loosely, as any action, the use or threat of which is designed to influence the government or to intimidate the public for the purpose of advancing a political, religious, or ideological cause. This definition was interlocked with the government's desire to stop people making statements supporting terror attacks in a clause outlawing the glorification of terrorism, which under the terms of that definition could embrace praise for the ANC or the Irish Easter Uprising or even the Boston Tea Party. <laughs> Meanwhile, CCTV cameras were being erected in Muslim areas, control orders applied, and of course, torture and rendition being undertaken abroad. No surprise that the Tory Lib Dem coalition agreement stated that the government believes that the British state has become too authoritarian. There's no question that much of the overlap between the Lib Dem and Tory manifestos was implemented, no ID card, no contact point less DNA retention, a reformed, though not abolished, form of control orders. The Lib Dems did indeed temporarily stop the so-called Snoopers Charter, giving the government access to people, people's online records, and most importantly, vetoed the repeal of the Human Rights Act. The big difference between the two manifestos was the Tory commitment to repealing the HRA and implementing a British Bill of Rights instead. Now, of course, the Liberal Democrat break has been removed, and what's happened? After a stutter under Michael Gove, the Justice Department under Liz Truss is now determined to repeal the Human Rights Act. Elsewhere, government legislation implemented and planned is increasingly focused on Muslims and based on the government's assumption that non-violent but religiously conservative opinion places a person on an escalator which ends up with terrorism. This idea underpinned the provisions of the 2015 Counter-Terrorism and Security Act, which placed the responsibility on local authorities and schools 
to prevent radicalization taking place. That's the act under which a 10-year-old boy was reported to the police after he'd misspelled terrorist and written, I live in a terrorist house. The escalator idea also informed a counter-extremism bill announced by Theresa May at the 2014 Tory conference, which would institute extremist disruption orders which gag speakers, preventing them from attending events or appearing on radio and television. This is an echo of the Thatcher era law which stopped IRA Sinn Féin spokesmen's voices being broadcast, thus providing welcome employment opportunities for the Northern Ireland acting community. <laughs> the orders would apply to those undertaking activities for the purpose of overthrowing democracy, again a pretty loose definition. It could involve people having to submit to the police any proposed publication in print or online before they made it. The banning order proposals were in the 2015 and 2016 Queen's speeches, but were believed to be on hold, partly due to a failure to find an acceptable definition of extremism. On top of developments in surveillance and policing, these developments represent huge dangers of themselves. But there's a wider political danger. The main topic of today and the weekend is the campaign against austerity and for a new economic strategy focused on public ownership investment and growth. However, we are not the only people advocating that. Across the continent and indeed the world, right-wing populist parties, out and sometimes in power, are advocating similar policies. From the French Front National, likely to be in next year's presidential runoff, to the ruling Polish Law and Justice Party, to the Austrian Freedom Party, which may well win the rerun presidential election in December. In his acceptance speech, Donald Trump advocated an uncosted program of public works unmatched since Roosevelt's New Deal. What such politicians and parties, including UKIP, are trying to establish is a new political fault line, allying interventionist and often welfareist economic policies with social stances which are conservative on sexual and gender issues, anti-civil libertarian and anti-immigration. I'm a supporter of the current Labour leadership's economic policies, but I'm also a supporter of their anti-racist stance and their long-standing commitment to civil liberties. Corbyn was one of the earliest parliamentary supporters of gay marriage. I voted for Diana Abbott in 2010 because she was the only candidate to insist Labour had to once again become the party of civil liberties. The most alarming development in the Labour Party between 2010 and 2015 was the rise of the blue Labour tendency, gurued by Boris Glassman, who calls for a complete ban on immigration, which seek to appeal to working class voters on a platform of faith, family and flag. I think the Labour Party has done most best when it has fought both for the economic interests of the working class and to defend the civil rights of groups and individuals. Take away working class interests and you're the libertarian wing of neoliberalism. Take away civil liberties, gender equality and anti-racism and you're UKIP. We need to fight for both. Yeah.